You're in the water loop. <laughs> Waterloop is made possible in part by grants from Springpoint Partners and the Walton Family Foundation. Waterloop. Hey, this is Travis with Waterloop. I want to tell you a story about High Sierra Showerheads, who I'm proud to have as a sponsor of this podcast, particularly because they make incredibly water efficient showerheads. I've talked with owner David Malcolm about growing up in California, learning about the importance of water and energy efficiency from his father. David has been designing high efficiency nozzles for agriculture and golf courses for the past 30 years. The golf course people actually came to him wanting a nozzle that produced a uniform spray but was water efficient. So David went in and designed a nozzle that explodes a low pressure stream of water into a shower of large powerful droplets. David actually thought this would make a great shower head. And that's how High Sierra Showerheads was born. And nobody has their nozzle technology. It's patented, and you get a great shower while saving water. Use promo code LOOP20 for 20% off at HighSierraShowerheads.com. You're in the Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. Going to talk about Memphis, Tennessee, what's happening in the community there, and environmental justice issues. Very pleased to have two guests with me for this episode. I have Chandra Taylor. She is the, a senior attorney and leader of the Southern Environmental Law Center's Environmental Justice Initiative. Chandra, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. And we have Marquita Bradshaw. Uh, she is the executive director of Sewing Justice. Marquita, glad we could connect too. Thank you for having me. There's a, a proposed pipeline project in Memphis that's a real concern to the community there. And I think that it's also reflective of national challenges, things that communities face across the country. So I really want to dig into this. Could, could someone explain what this proposal is in Memphis? The proposed project is for the Bahia pipeline to connect to the Valero refinery to actually ship oil uh, out of the country. And so it would go right through an African-American community, which is called Westwood, and also another community called Boxtown, where most of the people already own their homes, um, it's low income, and a majority African-American. And so the Bahia Pipeline Company has been using strong arm tactics to, to scare residents, um, into thinking that the pipeline is a done deal. And what uh, was able to be done in Memphis is Memphis um, communities against the pipeline uh, organized and coalition bill to get people involved in order to uh, put ordinances in city council and a county commissioner to stave off the pipeline. I'd love to hear about the environmental and public health concerns around this project. And also, I think, just the simple fairness issue uh, of, of trying to come through this community and, and take, use eminent domain and, and so forth. And so I'd love to hear more details about all these concerns. Uh, I actually grew up down the street from a Superfund site um, in, in South Memphis that was full of military toxins. So this pipeline, it will not be too far away from, from my childhood home. And it will actually uh, cut through some of my family members' land. Um, and the danger of this pipeline is about the, there, there are always leaks with pipelines, especially this type with this much pressure going through. And what makes um, Memphis so great is that we get our water from aquifers and it's some of the best water uh, around the world. And so this pipeline would actually um, damage our, the, the Memphis sands and leak into our aquifer and pollute our water if it spills. Because it's not, it's not if the oil spills, it's when it does. Uh, this company has had many infractions where it has had many spills all around the country. And so the health problem is, is it endangers our 
drinking water. And as you know, refineries, uh, we just had an issue with uh, Valero, Valero having an uncontrolled burn where you could see the fire shooting up all over the city. Mm. Um, and the people that live in the fence line communities, not only when it comes to this, this, the refinery, but Memphis historically is an environmental justice city where there has been in many landfills and, and, and just all type of, uh, registered polluters where you have Superfund sites and, and also brownfields throughout the city. And so being around facilities or, or these polluters, especially like the pipeline, increased cancer, increased um, respiratory diseases, it increased um, reproductive issues, and it just impacts every system of the body. I know when we were talking before, you know, you made the point that somebody needs to step back and look at the just cumulative impacts here, right? It's not even just about this one pipeline, but it's it's the idea that if you propose a project, you need to look at what that community has gone through over the years and what other, you know, stressors and pollutants and stuff that they're dealing with and and just kind of look at that big picture, right? Absolutely. So when you look at the type of permit that was used for the pipeline, um, it is a per- permit that circumvents um, an environmental assessment and also it circumvents including community voices like the Memphis communities against uh, the pipeline. Because when you have these permits that fast track without looking at the history of the community and the cumulative effects of pollution all over the city. Like right now, we don't need industries that pollute. We need some climate positive industries that actually heal the land and give uh, the people a break from having health effects from pollution. Chandra, maybe you could talk about how this is an example of the kind of situations facing communities, other communities, you know, throughout, throughout the South where you all work and even around the country. Yeah, unfortunately, this situation is what what we see when we see what environmental racism looks like and what environmental injustice looks like in so many different places. Like we know that zoning decisions, market forces, and a perceived lack of political influence or perceived lack of political power are often causes, including legal historic discrimination, causes of environmental injustice. So in Memphis right now, in Southwest Memphis, um, this community already has the Valero Refinery. There's a steel company. There's the retired TVA um, coal-fired power plant. And then there's the uh, coal ash pond associated with that plant. Um, there is a natural gas plant. There is a railroad yard. The community is also bordered um, by highways that contribute to air quality, you know, air quality degradation. So there are all of these, all of these varying polluting um, sources around this community, and in 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 you know, stories that we get to hear from our client group and our partners on the ground in Memphis, we know that there are early, you know, early deaths attributed to cancer and more deaths attributed to cancer than one would expect. Um, And we know that there's concern that what they're already facing is contributing to these early deaths. Um, And it's, unfortunately, it's not uncommon to see this type of pattern. So, we heard early on that when there was a question in the early days of organizing on this about why this part of Southwest Memphis was chosen for the route, the proposed route of the Bahalia pipeline, it was because the community was deemed to be the path of least resistance. So that perceived lack of political power and the effort to push through projects that are really undesirable for the environment and public health to push those projects onto already overburdened communities of color is just, is too common. And it's what we see happening now in Southwest Memphis with this proposed Behelia Pipeline route. 
The phrase environmental racism is one that I've seen more in the mainstream, if you will. You know, I think the f environmental justice, environmental injustice is something that I saw more commonly used, at least mm -hmm. in, in some more mainstream reporting and, and discussions. But I've, I have just noticed the environmental racism really rise up as a phrase. Um, and I imagine you all uh, in your work, have have used that phrase for a, a long time. Um, do you think that I'm right that now it's just popping up a little bit more into some of the mainstream conversation? What do you th what does environmental racism mean versus environmental justice, environmental injustice? Um, yeah, just kind of love to get your thoughts on on those questions. Well, before you can get to environmental justice, you have to have an injustice that actually happened. And environmental racism is where black, brown, indigenous, Asian, and poor white communities experience the burden of our industrial revolution because the way things are zoned. And so you see more of the things that pollute in these communities um, more so than the more wealthier communities where you have an actual elected official um, that lives on that street. And so it ends up being overburdened in these communities. And Memphis is one of those communities that is overburdened with pollution. And so when you think about environmental racism, it starts from how people are able to buy their housing in the lending industries with redlining, with also um, how zoning actually puts these type of industries that sometimes pay low and pollute at the same time. And so there's that element of where people work, it's where people live, it's where the people learn, it's where they worship and recreate. No matter who you are or where you live, you should have access to clean air, clean water right now and be able to be, be able to build towards a future where we leave that for our future generations. Chandra, do you want to share any of your thoughts on kind of my, my questions or observations? I can say that myself, that as a pr practitioner, having practiced law um, for over 20 years now, that it has become even more important to accurately um, name mm. what issue it is that we are fighting against. Um, the research is already there. Uh, when toxic race and waste um, was put out into the public, the publication of the United Church of Christ about um, the disproportionate burden of environmental harm on low wealth communities and communities of color. Even then, and, you know, at this point, I'm trying to think how far are we out from that report? I think we're over 40 years. Um, that even then, wealthier Black people were still more likely to have a toxic waste facility cited near them than lower wealth white people. So it's race still like, so talking about environmental racism, it's just like, like let's name what it is that people of color are bearing a disproportionate burden of environmental harm, even if they have more money. And that doesn't count that doesn't discount the struggles of low wealth people of all races. It doesn't discount the struggles of low wealth white people. Mm -hmm. But we should be clear that people of color, that African-Americans still are suffering from the, the vestiges and the ongoing institutional um, and systemic racism. So I think now people being much more clear about it is happening at, at a time in our nation and maybe even globally and I, I, that we are really reckoning with race issues. So talking about it um, clearly and not just talking about what one of the solutions is, I mean, environmental justice through a federal lens, you know, that's, that's looking at, you know, saying, okay, let's make sure that the federal government and its actions aren't um, having a disproportionate um, burden uh, p placing a disproportionate burden of environmental harms on community of color, and let's make sure there's um, fair treatment um, of fair treatment of people of color and low wealth people, and an ability to participate fully in the env environmental decision making process. Like you know, those are that's aimed towards solutions, but it doesn't quite 
it doesn't get all the way to a definition of like, well, what is the problem? And, you know, there are actually stronger solutions um, to deal with the problem than just having um, greater participation in environmental decision making, because people can participate as much as they want to, but that doesn't necessarily change the outcome um, in an environmental permitting decision. And what we're looking for is let's make decisions, let's make environmental permitting decisions that actually are not causing additional harm to already overburdened communities. I'd really like to hear um, about how the community in Memphis has responded from like a tactical standpoint and as an example of how a community anywhere in the country, if they're facing a situation like this, what's the approach? What do you need to do? What's kind of the playbook, Uh, you know, legal, regulatory, outreach? Um, Love to kind of hear that. Uh, maybe Marquita, you could talk about a little bit about how the the Memphis community has mobilized. Well, the the one thing about when you have a industry like big oil, you can't outspend them. But what you can do is organize and civically engage people around the process that makes the decisions in their communities. And so, what we have done is build a coalition that have pretty much challenged the pipeline at every end because when they came in, they said the Memphis community was the path of least resistance and it was a done deal. And now because of how Justin Pearson has led with Memphis communities against the pipeline and coalitions with So Injustice, Sierra Club and the Southern Law, um, the, the Southern Law and, Uh, Environmental Law Center, you see uh, what people power can do. And so that went from emailing city council, calling city councils, calling county commissioner, um, getting your congressional delegation involved, uh, like Steve Cohen, to be able to uh, challenge the Army Corps of Engineers decision about the National Permit 12, how that permit is usually used to benefit um, the community, whether it be a, a, a road or electrical system, to challenge it by being used from a private corporation and being able to use eminent domain. And so what the people in Memphis were able to do is knock on doors, talk about the problem, just basic grassroots organizing and leveraging people power. Mm. And anybody can do that wherever you go. Like right now, I'm on the road going to a community that is fighting a fuel depot. They they actually want to put a tap on the communities and in, in the community on the pipeline that's only going to create three jobs. And so, mm. <laughs> so... I thought it was important that I get to that community as soon as possible so we can leverage the civic engagement strategy because that's what we do at So Injustice. We make sure communities that are just coming in the game and sometimes in um, communities that's been in the game for a while, leveraging those relationships where they can not only get more local recognition, statewide recognition, and also national recognition, Mm -hmm. utilizing some of the tools that you mostly see in in, in political campaign. Mm. Chandra, from your perspective, you know, uh, the work you are involved in, Southern Environmental Law Center, what is that kind of, I guess, the playbook uh, when when there's a project that comes up that needs to get pushed back on? You know, Marquita talked about that community mobilization piece. What are what are some of the other uh, critical steps or areas of work? Um, So absolutely, community mobilization is really so much of what has to happen. By the time that we get to the stage of filing a lawsuit, by that point, we have gone through um, typically lots of other steps to push back against the project. Um, We have litigation going on now regarding the eminent domain process regarding nationwide permit 12 and the statements of 
um, our partners on the ground are integral um, to showing how they are going to be harmed um, if the projects move forward uh, as already had as they've already been identified. Um, but participating early uh, in local decision making um, is integral. Um, making, you know, getting involved on the zoning level. So like looking at anywhere in the nation, um, a lot of the decisions are made by local planning boards, um, by city councils and county commissioners about the type of uses um, that are appropriate for a certain piece of land. So any community that's getting that sees an environmental threat that is approaching them and possibly going to negatively impact their quality of life or um, harm the natural environment, then being clear about their opposition, being clear about the you know where it's um, where it's relevant, the the inappropriateness of the particularly proposed um, project on that land. I mean, there are there are communities that are cited for landfills where the water table is high. Um, there are communities like Southwest Memphis where there's a, so that that's another issue. There's drinking water that is at risk because of this particular pipeline. Like the, the path of this pipeline is inappropriate because of the natural environment, potential natural environment impacts and potential impacts on the health of the people who are already overburdened. So participating in those local, at the local level, um, looking toward um, what protections are available on the federal level that are not necessarily litigation. Um, so going before uh, just recently, just this week, um, uh, Memphis Community Against the Pipeline was speaking to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, asking that council to use their influence to, number one, abandon Nationwide Permit 12, um, and number two, make sure that like instead of having um, dirty fossil fuels um, as a solution um, for, you know, fuel needs, like let's invest in clean energy sources. Like, so appealing directly to federal bodies that have some influence, like the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Um, there's also, you know, there are also some administrative um, routes that communities can explore. Um, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination in the use of federal funding. Um, so complaining to the external office of civil rights, EPA's external office of civil rights regarding um, federal aid recipient uh, decision making that could be having, that could have a disproportionate adverse burden on a community of color. Like that's another route that, um, people who are facing an environmental, people who are a community of color facing environmental harm can look to that process. So um, definitely I agree um, with what already has been said about the power of communities on the ground, but also participating in those local decision making bodies, participating in federal decision making bodies, appealing to state agencies who are making decisions about whether or not a permit is going to go through. We're also pushing back against a state permit, a state aquatic resources permit um, that's being considered for the uh, Bahelia pipeline. So making sure that at every level, um, there's usually some place to weigh in on whether or not um, this, the local decision makers, the state decision makers, the federal decision makers can choose a different path rather than the one that's being proposed by the permit applicant. Um, so being on the lookout for those is, 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 is really a part of the playbook on um, pushing back against an environmental injustice and environmental racism. And, and I want to add that um, even creating ordinance on the front end that protect communities, um, that's proactive, with your with your land use uh, authority boards, um, building something in that recognize environmental racism, so they so it can be in the permitting process that if something falls in that category, that is automatic to die. Because most of the time, communities reach out after the decisions have been made for the pipeline to be en route, and that's when the Memphis 
Communities Against Pipeline got involved is when they found out it was going to be affecting their homes because of the permitting process only uh, recommends that they notify 24, send out 24 notices. And so that system within itself uh, is discriminatory by not giving people information. Last question I have, and you've kind of touched on this a little bit. So instead of Instead of having this type of project come through a community, you know, Memphis specifically or, or other communities in a similar situation, what, what should be happening? <laughs> I know there's a lot, right? I mean, that, there, there needs to be a complete reinvention here and a complete reinvestment. But let's talk about when it comes down to these, you know, new proposed projects. There is some need to like go forward in the country and generate energy in some way or to do different things, right? What's what's the constructive path? The constructive path is to start building towards a just transition where we're not dependent on fossil fuels um, by 2035. And what that takes is infrastructure right now, the infrastructure for clean, green, renewable energy, where you can get clean electric that's renewable, and also looking at the communities that have been affected by environmental racism and tackling some of the issues of making sure that these communities begin to heal, have industries where it does not pollute the air, have industries where it does not impact the water table, like in Southwest Memphis, where it is a refill area uh, when it comes to the water table because it's marshy. And so this is the reason why we need to move towards a just transition where we have an infrastructure that supports clean, green, renewable energy and not one that's built on pollution. Uh, Chandra, do you have anything you want to add to that from your perspective? In the same vein as Marquita, um, it's also January 27th. Um, President Biden issued Executive Order uh, 14008, and part of that executive order talks about the Justice 40 initiative. Um, I'm excited that that's something that's on the table where it's already set out, like 40% of federal investments, um, they should be going toward overburdened communities. Um, so investments in clean clean energy and energy efficiency and workforce development and affordable housing and cleanup of legacy contaminated sites um, and critical clean water infrastructure. You know, that, those are details that are set out in um, the executive order. And, and there's a plan that's being created by May, I think it's by May 27th of this year, we'll see recommendations for where these investments in this, you know, more sustainable um, sources of energy um, and more efficient, um, more, so clean transit. So looking at better environmental mm -hmm. outcomes for us, investing in those um, for communities that have been disinvested in, like that's significant that it's something that's on, you know, on the horizon for us. And I do think like like that's the direction that we should be looking, being very intentional about executive actions, about congressional actions that actually can turn the tide such that as a nation, we have a cleaner future. And also that the people who have been suffering a disproportionate burden are relieved of that and actually see real investment in the communities in a way that supports our growth um, and supports our good health. So, I mean, I think those are things that that are, are good and that we should be, you know, optimistic about and, and you know, that we should be energetic about making sure that those promises um, actually um, are fulfilled. Thanks to you both for coming on the podcast, talking about the situation in Memphis, talking about how this, you know, is something communities face around the country. Um, I really wanted to hear about how p communities should respond, you know, and, and share that type of model for, for others. But yeah, I appreciate you both so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good to see you both. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening to today's episode. A special thanks to Waterloop supporters, Spring Point Partners, and the Walton Family Foundation. The Waterloop Podcast is sponsored by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart, stylish way to save energy, water, and money 
while enjoying a powerful shower. Use promo code LOOP20 for 20% off at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. If you like Waterloop, please subscribe to the YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on social media and visit waterloop.org to sign up for updates. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop.